a bit like But tonight, to every one of you, I want to say a massive thank you because you are the people that have fought so hard to make Redland such an incredible place. You're here tonight because you have a dream that our future can be just as good and you know what an important role a federal government, its coalition, will do for that. We do you no service by not being in government. We do you no service by not fighting for what we know is right, but that has to always be titrated with the possible. And we have a democratic system that is among the most competitive and challenging in the world, and I think you know what I mean. Malcolm, here tonight you've got people that are slaved on the sides of roads, worked at pre-polling, worked with their friends, given to the organisation to make sure we can have great government, and done everything they can within their power to have such a great place that we know Redlands is. But we also know we face incredible challenges on the edge of one of the fastest growing cities in the world to protect the lifestyle that drew, that drew us here in the first place, but to also have the job so we don't all have to drive out of here every day. These are not unique challenges, but they're probably, as Karen, you acknowledge, about as acute as you'll find anywhere in Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, I love every day working with Malcolm. It's a complete privilege. He's not only a, a, a mind that you enjoy learning from, um, he tells some very, very good yarns, great company in Canberra. You come from a very different part of Australia than we do up here. Um, I think representing parts of Sydney that you do is in and of itself an extraordinary challenge. Uh, but both of us love, I think, the campaign to reach out to people, to hear what they've got to say, and ultimately to be the best possible representatives we can be. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome just a very brief address, Malcolm Turnbull. Well, well, thank you very much, thank you, and your worship. It's a uh, very honour to be in your I, I've always been very deferential to mayors because... Uh, Lucy was the mayor of Sydney at one point, so I've, uh, I've, 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 she was, uh, I've worshipped her all uh, the 35 years we've been together, or 37 years actually, just 35 years with benefit of clergy that was a bit going on before. But uh, anyway, I've always worshipped her, but it was, I was always thrilled when she was officially worshipful, you know, as well. So, uh, but you know... I, Pardon? She should be the bloody mayor again. Yeah, well, that, well, yeah, a lot of people say that. I don't think she's very keen on that idea. But anyway, uh, look, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, Andrew is uh, is a fat, you know he's a really unique force of nature in the Australian Parliament. Um, the great, great Andrew is actually well, he is. I tell you, I will tell you something about uh, Lamming, who you know, Andrew Lamming, you know very well, obviously, because he's your representative. But Andrew is a great example of the of the strength of the Liberal Party, or should I say here the LNP, uh, that unlike the Labor Party, we're not a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, we're not run by anybody. We're a grassroots organisation. Sometimes that can be, appear to be a bit chaotic, of course. Uh, democracies like that. Uh, but what that means is that we've got members of parliament who come from a very wide range of backgrounds. You know, Andrew's uh, medical background is, is diverse and unusual even for even for a medico uh, and yet uh, and yet we've got many other people from every walk of life we've got policemen and military people we've got business people big and small you know we've got farmers we've got an undertaker in the Senate you know who always who always sort of look wonder where he's measuring you up you know and, <laughs> Them, you know, yeah, that'd be a wood coffle number five. You know. So anyway, but he's uh, but we've got a wide range, and whereas Labor, as you know, basically they're all uh, you know p political professionals, apparatchiks out of the trade union movement. Um, so it's a this is a great. Uh, I know we've had a big setback here in Queensland, but we are a great grassroots political organisation. And even when you're feeling a bit down about our prospects or our position. Just think of the alternative, and that'll buck you up. That's what I would say. So, uh, and it's great to be with Bill Glasson here, who's such a phenomenal uh, political warrior too. Very, very, very. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's one of the most inspiring campaigners, and uh, really his dedication, his passion uh, for people, uh, whether as a as a political candidate, but of course with his wife Claire as a, as doctors, has just been extraordinary, real. Example, I know he's been a, a very, very big mentor of yours, Andrew, and uh, 
Okay, well, let me just say, I'll just say, I'm happy to take some questions, is that okay? Definitely. Yeah, good, that's good. Uh, but um, I'll just say a few things about the what what uh, we're doing with the NBN. Um, <clears throat> the NBN was a, uh, a really profoundly bad idea of the Labor Party. Uh, the, the, the normal way rational governments all around the world uh, do this broadband thing is to let the incumbents, you know, the existing telcos, get on with it, upgrade their services and provide some subsidies to make sure that uneconomic areas get served. Uh, only in Australia did the government decide to build an entirely new act customer access network itself and the project when we took over government was completely failed. It was, it was, a, it was, all, it was in many parts of the country it had stopped completely. It was dead stopped in uh, Western Australia, South Australia, Northern Territory and Tasmania and it was barely alive in the rest of the country. So it's been a big challenge to sort it out. Uh, I know, how many people are in the construction business here? Well, well you know, you, you'd all know that old saying, bad projects only get worse. Uh, well, this is a bad project that is, a, is actually getting better, I'm pleased to say. Uh, so we're getting on with it. The whole country will be covered by 2020. As I was just saying to the Mayor, um, everyone in Australia will have access to very good broadband. Um, and most of the country will be on a fixed line network with very high speeds. Uh, the, we've said that, that you know, the goal is to have nobody less than 25 megs, but uh, the vast majority will have speeds well in excess of that. Even you know, on the fibre to the node deployment, uh, we're seeing speeds of close to 100 megs already where that's being rolled out. Uh, in areas like Redlands where there is a lot of uh, HFC, of, you know, pay TV cable, We've taken, we're taking over all of that uh, from Telstra and indeed from Optus, where there's Optus cable, and we, for no extra money, I mean, this, is, this was infrastructure, by the way, Labor was paying these companies to switch off, to switch off, and we, so we said, look, well, how about you keep the money, but you give us the infrastructure, you're going to switch off, so we've got that, saves us tens of billions of dollars to have that, and with the HFC, we'll be able to deliver very quickly uh, speeds of well over 100 megs and within a year or two after we take it over, speeds of 250 megabits per second, really fibre-like speeds. And I'll be making actually some announcements about this uh, later in the week. Happy to take some questions if there's anyone interested in the technologies. Um, so there it is. Uh, the, uh, under the Labor Party, I have to say, it was... Um, it was quite good in one respect because nobody was getting any broadband, so everyone felt equally aggrieved. Uh, unfortunately, from a political point of view now, because the project actually is rolling out uh, around the country, people are saying, well, why is he getting it ahead of me? And uh, so the, the answer, of course, is that you can't do everywhere on the same day, and so there's a, a process. But I give you, you know, very, very seriously, genuinely, no uh, spin or nonsense. Everyone in Australia, and that means everyone in this electorate, in, in this area, in this in your uh, local government area, uh, Karen will have access to very, very fast broadband. So there won't be any, um, any, uh, you know, discrimination in that respect. So that's basically what's happening with the NBN. We're just getting on with the job. Uh, it's becoming boring from a political point of view, which is good. It's not on the front page anymore. And it's uh, going to be a, hopefully a big, well, will be a big utility. And um, I don't think it'll ever uh, be worth the amount of money that's been spent on it, I regret to say. There's a lot of money that's been wasted I can't get back. But nonetheless, we'll get it finished. So that's our commitment to you there. Now, I've talked for too long. Are there any issues you want to raise with me? Come yeah. Forward. If you've got a question, please come forward. If you just, if I, as long as I can hear it, I can repeat it for the benefit well, of others. My, my question maybe just got a little bit of skullduggery to it, but if you're getting bored with the job you're in, why don't you move up the line to the job? <laughs> <carrying it forward? laughs> Thank you. Well, that, that was, uh, what's your name? Bill. 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 Yeah, well, Bill, Bill uh, said his question had a bit of skullduggery and suggested I apply for another job shortly. And, but I'm actually not bored with my current job, Bill. Oh, uh, <laughs> but having said that, we're not, uh, the skullduggery is not entirely unknown in camp. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir.
Yeah, come yeah, forward, Bob. Come forward. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you grab it. Yeah, yes, Malcolm and, uh, and acknowledge you, Karen and Negra. Um, uh, some of the uh, simplistic stuff we see in the newspapers and what they regard as newsworthy on television news and things like that these days, one gets the feeling we're getting dumbed down in society. And uh, I just wonder if uh, maybe the bar could be raised educational wise and what they're feeding us on TV. Uh, it's just beyond belief how simplistic some of the news is we're getting in the Thank you. Yeah, well, well, thanks, Paul. I, I think um, uh, Winston Churchill once said that complaining about the press is about as useful as complaining about the weather. Uh, so, you know, I, sadly we're always disappointed by the media. But I tell you what I think Andrew and I can do and, our, and politicians can do and mayors can do, and I'm sure you would do this, Karen, anyway. Uh, the, I, I think that those of us in, in politics, you know, in leadership roles, and we're all leaders of political representatives, is I think we've got to treat the electorate with more respect. I think there's been far too much dumbed down sloganising uh, and uh, far too much spin, and so you're better off just laying out the facts, explaining what your problems are, uh, and then once you do that, once people understand there's a problem, they will then accept that something has to be done. Now, they may not agree with what your something is, but at least then you've got to first base. And as I said in the speech in Brisbane today, I think that was the problem with the budget last year. We didn't get the first base, and that was our fault. Um, but I'll give you an example of, uh, of leaving aside the NBN, which is a different issue, but take Australia Post. Now, you know, that's a business that's been around for forever, for a couple of hundred years, uh, and it's... Um, and the letters business is, has, has lost since 2008 one and a half billion dollars. Now it's amazing that, again, I don't want to go off at the Labor Party, but it's amazing that they did nothing about it. Because the problem was every year people were sending fewer letters. It's a very high fixed cost business and you can imagine it just went further and further into the red to the point where if we don't do something about it, the whole company, Australia Post, will be all in the red the losses on letters will overwhelm the profits on parcels and retail, and the whole show will go bankrupt. You have 32,000 people out of a job. So, pretty serious stuff. So, when we got in, I said to the management, just tell everybody the truth about the economics of your business. Just tell it again and again and again, you know, in every possible way. Just, just, just be completely open about it and transparent. And they did. <clears throat> bored everybody witless with the problem, uh, which was good. Because just, be, you know, they say about in politics, at the point where you feel you cannot repeat yourself without throwing up because you're so bored with what you're saying, at that point you just might be getting through. Uh, so you've got to be persistent. But we, we got independent verification of what the problem was. And then, as people accepted the problem, and so saying, what are we going to do about it? Well, the answer, sadly, is we're going to have to put up the price of stamps a lot. Uh, we're going to have to make regular mail uh, arrive two days later to cut costs on, on sorting. Uh, but we've worked out a way to protect the jobs of people in post. Uh, this will, we've worked out a way to protect licensed post offices. They, overall, will be big beneficiaries of this. And because a lot of our older Australians still like to write letters, I mean, consumer mail is only a couple of percent of the total, the vast majority is business and government. Uh, we've said uh, concession card holders can get 50 stamps a year at 60 cents, and of those who still like sending Christmas cards, there'll be Christmas stamps in November and December will be 65 cents. So, you know, that's... So what... And broadly speaking, even though it's a pretty bitter pill in many respects, uh, that has been accepted. And I think that was a... A good example of, of if you actually tell the truth, explain what the issues are, put out your solution, if nobody comes up with a better one, well, you'll probably get support from it. So, that's... Yeah, well, there you go, a former postmaster. Well, you know, if, if, uh, if uh, in the old days I would be called the postmaster general, and I'm very... <laughs> Tony Abbott's a traditionalist, and I was, uh, I was really hoping I'd be called the postmaster general. <laughs>
but he, uh, but you know, he was uh, he was able to go as far as knights and danes, but not as far as Paul and the postmaster general. So. Yeah, you know, but on a slope of lawyer. Um, first, you thank you for coming to business in the Redlands. Uh, my question is to do with the Senate. Uh, it seems to me that the Senate has completely and utterly lost its way. It's an obstructive, uh, bureaucratic process now. Uh, it was designed as a state's house to represent state's interest, uh, but it does not have that function anymore. It's completely politicised. Uh, when is somebody going to stand up against that? Well, that, that's a good question. Um, can, I, can I just say that um, I am a, uh, I'm not expert on many things, but I, I, I am extremely expert and experienced on not changing the Australian Constitution. So, uh, uh, the, uh, so if you want to embark on a constitutional change with the Senate, good luck. I'll, I'll give you lots of advice, but, uh, but I, uh, I wouldn't... I, look, uh, the Senate's going to be there forever, as long as we are a federation. The question is how the Senate is elected. That, that, that's, that's the real issue. Uh, well, there are actually there are two there are two issues. There's one that the nexus, the provision that says that uh, the Senate shall be as nearly as practicable half the size of the House of Representatives. And that's why we've ended up, you know, we've got a House of Representatives with 150 members, which is not huge given that you know there's 23 million people represented there. But means we've got uh, 76 senators, two from each territory and 12 from each state. So Tasmania has five. MPs and 12 senators, um, for example. It is, um, the real issue is how they're elected. And, and the parliament can change the method of election. You don't need to change the constitution for that. And there have been different methods. Uh, I think there's a, a general recognition, wouldn't you say, Andrew, that, that there's got to be reform. And there's a lot of discussions going on uh, between the parties in Canberra nowadays about that. But, you know, one proposal that a lot of people have canvassed um, is to, which is common in, in many systems, is to say that unless you get a certain minimum percentage of the overall vote, you will be excluded. So you would say, you know, say you made it 5% or 3%, that would mean that somebody who got a 1,000 primary votes could not, through some cunning preference deal, end up in the Senate. You'd have to have a solid basis of support before you you know, were eligible to stay in the count. Anyway, the, the, but as long as you've got proportional representation, it is very unlikely that the government will have a majority. We, we've only, I think, there's only a couple of times in my lifetime the government's had a majority in the Senate. Uh, but it is, it is very hard at the moment because if you just don't, it's very hard. We've got to get six of the eight cross benches to get any legislation passed if Labor and Greens oppose it. And it's very hard to know um, whether you can succeed in doing that. I mean, we've done it on a few occasions, but they're a very diverse group, to say the least. Um, what can we do to stop all the left-wing claptrap that has been forced down our throat by the ABC? Yeah. <laughs> it's about 50 of the time, but not 99% of the time. <coughs> okay, well, well thank you. The, um, Look, the, the ABC uh, has a legal obligation to be accurate and impartial in the... No, they do. Oh, they just, do. Just, just, they do. Just, hear, just bear me out. Hear me out. Um, the, they are, the government has no control over the content. Uh, you know, I can't tell them what to broadcast. And I don't think I should. I mean, you'd be better off having no public broadcaster than having one which the the government of the day to direct if you'd end up like Russia. Um, <clears throat> the board of directors are the ones that have the responsibility under Section 8 of the Act for ensuring that um, uh, you've got to be, you've got to have, uh, be accurate and impartial in the presentation of news and uh, current affairs. <clears throat> and uh, I have been um, drawing the board's attention to their obligations there or their responsibilities there recently and they uh, you know, they assert that they are taking it uh, much more to heart. I think the, uh, I, I, I don't think, I think the ABC, look, I know, there, there are uh, presenters and journalists on the ABC that I know uh, 
you, you could you know legitimately say have got a point of view or a leftist leftist point of view. One of the virtues of the ABC, from our point of view, from Andrew's and my point of view, is that they've got a lot of microphones which you can get access to. You know, people sometimes say to me, "Why do you go on Q and A? The audience is always so biased." Well, you know, some, I, I'm not sure that's right. I remember one night when two thirds of it consisted of young liberals from Sydney University, you know, and I'm quite sure that some of them had told them, the producers that they were Labor supporters in order to get on. But anyway, nonetheless, nonetheless, if you think about it, from our point of view, we're in the communications business. If the interviewer is biased, if the audience is biased, as long as we've got that microphone and that camera and we're getting into a million or a million and a half households, that is a very, very big channel. And uh, then, you know, ABC Radio is the same story. So, you know, the challenge for our side of politics is actually to be on the ABC and take advantage of the fact that you can actually get access. You know, if you think of the free-to-air uh, commercial television stations, they don't actually run a lot of politics. You know, we, they don't have programs that, that like Late Line or Q&A or, uh, you know, or um, 7.30 report. And so... So it's not, it's a, anyway, I, I understand the point, the, and the ABC has to be objective, they have to be impartial, that is their obligation, and we draw, hold them to account on that, but it's a very, very powerful platform, you know, because it doesn't matter what the interviewer, well, it doesn't matter what question the interviewer asks you, they can ask you any question they like, they can ask you the meanest, most biased question, once you've got that microphone and that camera, you can say whatever you like. And you've got that, you've got the ability, just, you've just got to think, don't, you've got to think about, forget about the interviewer, forget about the audience in the studio, think about the audience at home. And that's what I, that's why I go on a lot of those programs. And, you know, the last time I was in Q&A, they got into one and a quarter million households. I mean, that is a lot of reach. And if Tony Jones is being biased, I couldn't care less. My only concern was how I could get our government's message to those people at home. Thank you.